City skylines tell the story of progress and commerce on the Canadian prairies. But only two centuries ago, the landscape was completely different, overflowing with a resource that was coveted but dangerous to reap. Its harvest incited conflict between cultures led to the depletion of species and forever changed a people's way of life. The resource was fur, and some of the most restless and violent years of the fur trade were witnessed through the eyes of a man who has largely been forgotten since his death. That man is Peter Fiddler, an explorer, surveyor, and fur trader of remarkable intelligence and instinct Fiddler's story reads like a map to one of the most turbulent eras of Canadian history. Peter Fiddler was born in the Midlands of England in 1769 and grew up in the quiet coal mining town of Balsiver. Under the imposing form of Balsiver Castle, his childhood home still stands, where as a boy he lived with his family, who were able to provide him with a better than average education. But likely still, at a young age, Fiddler became aware of the Hudson's Bay Company and their adventures in the New World. Today, one of Britain's busiest motorways, the M1, winds its way past Balsover to London. And that's where Fiddler went. When of age, he moved to the city and eventually paid a visit to the Hudson's Bay Company offices, where he enlisted for service in North America. Every year, a supply ship would cross the Atlantic Ocean and land in Hudson's Bay, filled with trading goods and company servants. They came from all over Europe, but they were all looking for the same thing. Although the Hudson's Bay Company traded for many types of furs, their principal target was beaver. The furs were obtained from the First Nations people who trapped, then traded the skins for manufactured goods brought over from Europe. In the beginning, everyone got what they wanted. Beaver skins were the main commodity in the production of felt, which was used to manufacture hats. These hats were not only a practical part of one's wardrobe, but a fashionable indicator of social class. The demand was huge and the potential profits were staggering. Not surprisingly, competition developed. The Hudson's Bay Company structured all operations in North America from their posts on Hudson's Bay. But by the 1790s, a rival fur trade company based in Montreal, the Northwest Company had aggressively risen and surpassed them. Expanding west from the St. Lawrence, the Norwesters had penetrated as far inland as the prairies. These traders were gaining superior access to the native tribes who provided the furs for the industry. In London, the Hudson's Bay Company management decided to move their operations inland as well. A new era of fur trading had arrived and Peter Fiddler was about to land in the middle of it. Peter Fiddler arrived in what was to become Manitoba in the fall of 1788. He was to spend his first winter here at York Factory, employed as a simple labourer. The post was the jumping off point for Hudson's Bay Company men, who had been arriving on supply ships since the late 17th century. For all of them, life in the New World was a shock. The weather was colder than anything they had experienced. There were icebergs on the bay. Even the light was different. It would be a long winter for Fiddler, but with warmer weather came new possibilities. In the spring, Fiddler set out with a group of traders destined for deep in the interior. His ability to read and write was a prized asset, since many company servants were illiterate. Fiddler was an articulate and observant young man, and his superiors took note. If he had dreams of exploration and adventure, they were about to become a reality. The Hudson's Bay Company quickly discovered that he was literate and numerate, uh, and even uh, clever with accounting, but they hadn't hired him for this. They'd hired him uh, to come out as uh, merely uh, a 
a drudge, but it turned out he had some talent and he was fairly quickly promoted. Most of the servants that they brought out were uh, not very ambitious and not very interested in advancing. They were taking their money, clipping their coupons, and, and going home. But obviously, obviously, Fiddler was something out of the ordinary, so his advancement would be much more rapid than that of most of the employees. Fiddler's first assignment would take him up the Saskatchewan River where he was to perform basic writing and bookkeeping duties. Of course, the journey was by water, and Fiddler quickly learned the physical demands of a long-distance canoe trip. It's really important to try to get our mindset back into a scenario where everything is done by water and where your whole perception of the land is from the water. I think that's a hard understanding for us to get back to because we're so used to highways now. Native people themselves, when they thought of land, they thought of the land along the rivers because that was where the resources were. That's where the fur-bearing animals were, um, as well as where you'd travel, where you'd camp, and so on. You looked at land from the water. On their quest inland, the Hudson's Bay Company men were always striving for the best quality furs in the highest quantity possible. It was an established fact that this wealth of furs existed in the vicinity of Lake Athabasca. The Northwest Company had tapped this resource by establishing trading posts on Lake Athabasca and filling them with dozens and dozens of men. The Athabasca region at the end of the 18th century was the, the pot of gold for all fur trading companies. Uh, it was the last great fur trade area in North America. And it was also the richest fur trading area in North America. Uh, the climate was conducive to the production of superior uh, furs, particularly beaver skins. For the Tardy Hudson's Bay Company, competing in the region meant mapping a more efficient route from Lake Athabasca to Hudson's Bay, literally hundreds of miles away. But first, they needed surveyors to create the maps. And so, in June of 1790, Peter Fiddler found himself at Cumberland House, near what is now the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border. Fiddler had impressed everyone with his cleverness and sharp intellect. He clearly was the perfect candidate for training under his company's new initiative. Under the guidance of Philip Turner, a senior Hudson's Bay Company surveyor and explorer, Fiddler learned how to read longitude and latitude and record his findings. At only 20 years of age, he was being groomed as a first-class company cartographer. Turner would teach Fiddler to use all the tools of the trade, but especially the sextant. Used to measure the altitude of celestial bodies, the sextant was one of the most important instruments a surveyor of the time used. Fiddler would keep one by his side for the rest of his life. Throughout this training period, Fiddler was receiving knowledge that would eventually bring him to the pinnacle of his career, and he was getting it from the most authoritative source around. For Fiddler, it was nothing short of a life-altering event. And so, Turner, with Fiddler as his assistant, headed towards Lake Athabasca with a small contingent of men surveying the route as they went. It was to be a journey that would place Fiddler in the spotlight of the Hudson's Bay Company management and accelerate his promotion within the company. The trip to the Athabasca region was cut short at Illa La Crosse when winter set in earlier than anticipated. While waiting for spring, Fiddler jumped at an opportunity to leave the post for three months and live with the Chippewyan Indians. As Fiddler traveled with the Chippewyan, he studied their customs as much as they studied his. He learned their language and became intimately acquainted with their culture. He observed everything and recorded it all in his journal. February the 7th, 1791. This night dreamt in the Chippewyan language the first time, and I appeared to have a more extensive command of words when asleep than when awake. 
one of the things you have to remember is that, that a guy from Derbyshire does know a hell of a lot about uh, woodcraft, about living in the wilderness. Uh, and, uh, and he's got to learn all that stuff. And, and the way in which all these fur traders learned, of course, was by living with the First Nations people for long periods. When spring finally arrived, Fiddler rejoined Turner and continued to Lake Athabasca. Along the way, Fiddler made an important note in his journal. He had noted liquid tar oozing from the riverbank and suggested that it might be useful. He couldn't have been more right. Fiddler had just made the first written account of what is now known as the Athabasca tar sands. Today, believed to be the largest petroleum resource in the world, the tar sands contain an estimated 1.6 trillion barrels of oil waiting to be refined. It's a deposit that amounts to almost one-third of the world's total oil supply. But in Fiddler's time, the treasure of the region was furs, and no one paid much attention to the tar. Turner's party continued north, and a summer of extensive survey and exploration ensued. The men recorded anything in the region that might be of interest to their employers. Turner would bring this new information back to London and the Hudson's Bay Company would use it to devise detailed maps and make important decisions about developing operations in the Athabasca region. The journey was to become a major contribution to the mapping of North America and it was the first of many great accomplishments for Peter Fiddler. In the fall of 1792, Peter Fiddler travelled west to oversee the construction of a post called Buckingham House. When construction was well underway, Fiddler commenced a journey on foot towards the Rocky Mountains. This time he was travelling overland with the Pigan Indians, who had taken him in for an entire winter, surveying and exploring deep into what is now southern Alberta. On a warm summer day, it's hard to imagine that a winter-long trip on foot across the prairies would even be possible. But Fiddler was in good hands and he was pleasantly surprised by the warm winter. En route, Fiddler saw and made detailed observations of buffalo jumps, such as the old woman's jump south of High River. Fiddler watched in amazement as dozens of the animals at a time were swept over what was then a much steeper cliff to their violent demise. Naturally, every detail went into his journal. The Pigans also brought Fiddler to meet with the Snake and the Kootenai Indians, who had never encountered a white man before and were anxious to do so. December the 12th, 1792, the Snake Indians viewed us from head to foot and from foot to head. With the greatest attention felt at our skin in places, and expressed great astonishment at us, particularly at our having different colored hair from any Indian. Fiddler's travels with the Pigans continued as far south as the Old Man River before heading back north. He had seen the Rocky Mountains for the first time and made detailed geographical observations everywhere he went. But this was to be a journey of many firsts for Fiddler. While traveling north, he recorded the first observation of cactus in the region. Then, while he was in the vicinity of modern-day Drumheller, he made the first discovery of coal on the prairies. Following his journey with the Pigans, Fiddler returned to York Factory and awaited his next set of orders. The wait would end up lasting two years. But nonetheless, Fiddler found a very productive use of his time. He met a Cree woman named Mary and began a relationship that would last the remainder of his life. From now on, Mary would accompany him almost everywhere. When he was with the Chippewyans, because he didn't have a wife, his clothes were falling apart, he had to try mending his clothing himself, he complains about this. He's, he's on his own. He does not have the skills needed. The women were very important for their role in making clothing, in getting food, in small-scale trapping, fishing, that sort of thing. 
also as translators, as guides. And it's interesting, actually, that the women were usually more important in navigation. Uh, just think, you know, who gets to sit in the front of the canoe and point out where you should be going while the man is busy steering in the back. So I think we underestimate the role of women as, as navigators, as guides. And um, often, of course, the traders didn't realize the, the circle of relatives they were getting into and the circle of obligations. And traders would sometimes take these women for convenience, for pleasure, and so on, and not realize the implications. But I think Peter Fiddler, being a serious sort, he, he came to understand his obligations and his connections, and he grew really attached to his family. By the end of the 18th century, the fur trade was thundering across the continent relentlessly. As the Northwest Company flourished, the Hudson's Bay Company struggled to play catch-up. A complicated network of traders worked furiously to extract the skins, who were supported by canoe brigades, which were in turn supported by a growing industry of pemmican production. There were express canoes carrying letters and messages to posts hundreds of miles apart. And of course, there were the precious few surveyors. Into this machine, Peter Fiddler cast his contributions. It came to be that when an individual was needed to spearhead construction of a new post or mapping of a new canoe route, more and more the Hudson's Bay Company was calling on Fiddler. By 1799, he was the only person who held the prestigious title of company surveyor. And so, that year, Fiddler ascended the Beaver River to build posts in opposition to the Northwest Company. Fiddler and his men were constantly harassed by the Nor'westers, who traveled ahead of them, scaring off game. Soon the expedition was running dangerously low on food. Slowly but surely, Fiddler and his men continued on anyway, though at points the river was barely passable. Eventually, Fiddler found his way up the swampy channel that led to Meadow Lake. At Meadow Lake, Fiddler established Bowls of Her House, the post he named after his hometown. But there would be no time for nostalgia. After only a month, Fiddler moved on to Lac La Biche, where a post was being built for him. Here he spent an entire winter trading, mapping and observing, and the observations were endless. Throughout his travels, Fiddler recorded everything from encounters with natives to animal and plant species. He was doing it all in service to his company to paint a clearer picture of the new world which they all knew so little about. It all went into his journals, but perhaps knowingly, Fiddler was creating documents which would be of immeasurable value for generations to come. Generations who would mine the work for all its detail and then come back to it again and again. Fiddler was literally writing the history books. Why do you go into a trading relationship? You go into it because you think you'll benefit. And the Europeans went in for their benefit. From their perspective, they could bring over, you know, cheap knives and beads and hatchets and, and relatively inexpensive things, and they could trade them to people for these wonderful furs, which would have fantastic value back home. But from a native perspective, what counted most? It was absolutely wonderful to have these steel blades, to have the knives and the hatchets, steel needles. In the early days, there were lots of furs. There were lots of beaver. They could go out and get more beaver, and they could get um, what to them was amazing wealth in return for what they had lots of. But in some areas, things were beginning to get difficult. Most native tribes had never been sedentary. But now, pressure to move was growing. Pressure from neighbors who were better armed, from disease, from depleted fur resources. And the fur trade competition was heating up. Eventually, some tribes were being pushed or pulled into each other's territory. In a desperate scramble for resources and survival, conflict escalated. Such was the situation on the South Saskatchewan River, near what is now the Alberta border. Here in 1800, Fiddler established Chesterfield House, and as was expected, the Northwest Company built a post next door. Although they were competing, the traders from both companies worked together, 
sharing resources and protection, and always fearing an attack by one of the local tribes. There were close calls, but Fiddler emerged unscathed. It was to be the last time he experienced cooperation from the Norwesters. For in 1802, he was headed back into the competitive Athabasca region, this time to establish a Hudson's Bay Company post. Armed with only a small contingent of men, he was to compete against hundreds of Norwesters, some of whom would stop at nothing to see him leave. It was to be his most tortuous assignment. 